I think I'm going to introduce our speaker this morning. Oh, we're very excited to have Dr. Roger Launius talk about the shuttle program, a very timely topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll take this. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me try that again. Good morning, everyone. OK. Uh, hey, it's, it's a pleasure to have you all here at the museum. I hope you've been enjoying your time here the last uh, day or so, and I hope you'll spend some more time uh, before you have to, to head back to your homes uh, and, and, and take a look around uh, the museum in some detail, talk to, the, talk to the docents, talk to the various other folks that are out. What I want to do uh, for about 20 minutes this morning is just take you through a breathless survey of the history of the space shuttle. It's a very timely topic. Uh, and, and it's especially timely right now because the, the last flight of the space shuttle, 135 of them in all, but the last one uh, tomorrow uh, is scheduled to launch from the Kennedy Space Center. And, and we all approach that with kind of a bittersweet uh, perspective. We are excited that this program is, uh, has been underway for so long, that it's been so successful, and it really has. Uh, as well as uh, a, a sense of, of, of uh, sadness associated with that program going away and being replaced with something else. And, uh, and then a happiness that we're going to get, a dis going to get uh, the shuttle discovery out at the Udvar Hazy Center. We're very pleased about that. Uh, and, and we're pleased to tell the story uh, in this gallery, Moving Beyond Earth, about the uh, prospects of human space flight since the moon landings. And this whole gallery is built around that concept. So much of it's about the space shuttle, and you can see our model over there, uh, about the International Space Station, and you can see our model back here. And also, back in this section, uh, we will be putting in a, a, a major exhibition uh, about prospects for the future. What might we see in the next 30, 40 years in space? And there's all kinds of really exciting things about that. But my, my task this morning is to talk about the Space Shuttle, which has been this remarkable program uh, that's been around since uh, 1981. Um, it, it really began in the aftermath of the moon program when we landed on the moon in the 1960s and the early 1970s, and everybody here does believe we landed on the moon, right? You'd better. I can go at length with you any debate you want to have on that particular subject, but if you walk out of this door believing or even questioning that we landed on the moon, you're wrong. <laughs> we did. But what do you do for an encore after you've been to the moon in the United, uh, with the United States uh, space program in the 1960s? Well, the answer to that uh, for NASA was build a winged reusable vehicle. And there's a long history of this idea. You know, when we flew the astronauts to the moon, they went up in these little tiny capsules and they came down on parachutes and landed in the ocean and had to be rescued at sea by the Navy. And I got to tell you, the Air Force guys hated that. The Navy having to come and rescue them, not something that they enjoyed at all. But we always thought we were going to do this in the context of a winged reusable vehicle, a space plane, if you will. And so all these ideas go back to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, in the 1930s, a German by the name of Eugene Sanger uh, developed this concept for a skip bomber. It would be launched like a rocket up to the upper part of the atmosphere, and it would skip along the top of the atmosphere, going in and out with intercontinental range capabilities. And his idea, by the way, since he was a German right at the time of, uh, of World War II, was we can bomb New York from Germany uh, with this particular uh, spacecraft. That never got built, but it was still an idea that, uh, that was pursued from a research standpoint. In the 1950s, there were all of these ideas about space planes, and some of you may have heard of an artist by the name of Chesley Bonestell, and I hope most of you have heard of, a, of, of an engineer and a theoretician named Werner von Braun, uh, who developed a concept for a winged reusable spacecraft in the 1950s, and they were going to use that to go to and from Earth orbit, to rendezvous with a space station, and then use that space station to go to the moon and Mars and other places. And the concepts were published in a magazine called Collier's in the 1950s. And here is one of those winged reusable space planes. Here is another. Uh, and that's the idea. 
And in the latter part of the 1950s and into the 1960s, the Air Force was involved in what was known as the X-20 program, uh, also called Dinosaur, for dynamic soaring. They love their acronyms. Uh, but there's a catchy term, Dinosaur, which also was a space plane. And that program got to the point where they were almost ready to fly, and then, they, and then uh, the military canceled the, canceled the program. All of this is happening in the 1940s and 50s, and there is serious efforts to, to work toward a space plane. So we go to the moon using capsules, but no sooner did we get to the moon than we decided we wanted to build a space plane. And the answer to that, obviously, is the vehicle that we are going to launch for the last time tomorrow, the, uh, uh, the space shuttle with its two uh, solid rocket boosters on either side, the, the uh, external tank here containing uh, liquid propellant and oxidizer, the main engines, and the, and the orbiter that is reusable uh, that, uh, that we have now flown, the, uh, the ones that exist, for a total of 135 times. That's the vehicle that we pursued. It was not necessarily intended to look like it does now. Early concepts were all over the map in terms of what we were going to do. I particularly like, uh, like this one as a trimese, but this is the original concept that NASA came up with. You build a large vehicle about the size of a Boeing 747. It's got a pilot and crew in this vehicle. It flies up with this on its back. Uh, up to the upper atmosphere, then this separates from it and flies on into orbit. That's the orbiter. It would be about the size of a Boeing 707. Both of them were reusable. Both of them would have been able to land on runways when they came home. That's what NASA wanted, a fully reusable vehicle. They didn't get it. Cost too much money. Uh, other ideas as well, the trimese concept here with the with orbiter that you can see that was uh, kind of stuck between these two big uh, boosters on one side. Another one that looks very, uh, very much like a Buck Rogers space plane. And then this kind of belly uh, approach here with a, with a vehicle, again with a crew aboard and, uh, and, and the orbiter riding underneath it uh, that would then go on into orbit. Those are some of the ideas, only some of the ideas. There were lots of concepts out there. We eventually chose the space shuttle as you know it today because of engineering difficulties and the, um, and the possibilities of costs associated with that. So that's the vehicle in orbit today. Uh, it's a lovely vehicle. It's done remarkable things, but it's not what NASA envisioned in the late 1960s. So it is, I would suggest to you, a creature of compromise. And most of that compromise was the result of the costs involved. Uh, NASA developed a plan to build a $10 billion vehicle. They could only get funding for about $5 billion, so they obviously had to compromise. And that was the reason why they took the approach that they did. It's also a one-size-fits-all. NASA envisioned this vehicle as the all-purpose launcher that everybody was going to use for everything. It had a payload bay. It could handle people. Uh, you could take satellites up. You could capture satellites up there and repair them. You could capture them and bring them back. You could do all kinds of things with it. And everybody was going to use the shuttle for everything didn't quite work out that way. It, uh, it, it, never, it never became the all-purpose vehicle that was intended, but nonetheless, uh, it was pretty, re uh, pretty remarkable and flexible as a vehicle. It was difficult to build. The program was approved uh, in 1972, and NASA began work on the uh, technologies needed to do it. And there were two big ones that were new and different and, and uh, delayed the program. The first was, um, does anybody? Does anybody know what this is right here? It's a space shuttle main engine. Uh, the most sophisticated rocket engine ever developed. It's not as large as the rocket engines used on the Saturn V that took us to the moon, but nonetheless, it's more sophisticated than those. And it proved to be a difficult task to make it uh, work successfully. And it took them about three years longer than they intended to, to get those working right. Uh, the other problem that they had was the thermal protection system. And here you can see a workman underneath the orbiter replacing tiles. And everybody knows about the shuttle tiles, uh, how fragile they are. They're kind of a ceramic. You, if you drop them on the ground, they will break. 
uh, but they are very, very heat resistant. And they're perfect uh, uh, for dealing with the friction of reentry and the heating associated with that. Uh, but it took a while to get that working properly, and we've still had problems with it right up to the present, uh, as they have to replace tiles after every flight, uh, and they have to do a, a variety of things to keep the shuttle operating properly. That's one of the reasons why it's time to move on to a new vehicle, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we began flying the first flight in 1981. Those of you who are a little older will remember that first flight and how exciting it was as we sent those two astronauts, John Young and Bob Crippen, up on that first mission into space. They landed out at the, uh, uh, in the Mojave Desert uh, two days later. It was a very exciting experience as this particular vehicle for the first time flew into orbit. And we were not going to fly it beyond Earth orbit. We were going to do tons of interesting things in Earth orbit. There's kind of a timeline here. You don't need to read it, um, uh, except I will tell you that there were a couple of enor enormously important events. Uh, two of them were accidents, the Challenger loss in 1986, the Columbia loss in 2003, in which we lost the orbiters and their crews. Uh, tragic event uh, uh, for, for the nation, literally for the world, as we undertook those activities. And there was great excitement as well. Um, in other, in other missions, the deployment of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope, the servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope using the shuttles, uh, the flight in 1998, and again, some of you who are a little older will remember uh, that particular flight when John Glenn, American hero from the Mercury program who had flown in space in 1982 and had gone off and done all kinds of other things, including be a, being a senator from Ohio, decides not to be a senator anymore and to make one last flight into space. I got to tell you, it was one of the most exciting things I ever saw. I was at NASA headquarters at that point. John Glenn decides he's going to fly, and it's like 1962 all over again. The public is engaged. The people are excited. An American hero uh, went up. Some people complained that he shouldn't have flown, that, uh, that he was just, uh, you know, this kind of old guy who, uh, who, uh, who didn't belong in space. Not really true. Uh, Walter Cronkite, again, some of you who are a little older will remember him as a broadcaster who said, uh, who made the comment at the time, you know, John Glenn is an American hero, and he can do pretty much anything he wants, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that's kind of how I feel, too. Uh, you prepare for launch. It's an interesting uh, process to, uh, to get an orbiter ready to go. It has to, uh, has to be mated to its uh, launch vehicle apparatuses. They do that in, the, in the, uh, the vehicle assembly building down at the Kennedy Space Center. They roll it out to the pad, and here you can see two shuttles. This is actually a remarkable picture. Two shuttles on the two uh, Pad 39 uh, uh, launch complexes, one in the distance and one, of course, right here. Uh, since Columbia, we have had a second vehicle ready to fly uh, if uh, there was anything happening uh, like what happened with Columbia. So we could go up, presumably, and rescue uh, the crew on that other, other vehicle. Uh, and then in the distance, I just love this little rainbow as it's going down. In orbit, we do all kinds of things. The payload bays are usually opened up, and, uh, and, we, uh, uh, and they engage in the various activities associated with that. I'm going to step through this very quickly because my time is passing past. Uh, what we have done with the space shuttle in 134 missions now is learn how to live and work in Earth orbit, in microgravity, and to do all kinds of useful things. Here you can see astronauts doing an EVA, uh, astronauts engaged in activities in the, uh, in the payload bay, the flight deck, and of course the outside of the vehicle. Um, inside, we've done remarkable experimentation. This is the astronaut Mary Ellen Weber. Uh, she, is, she was not a pilot in the traditional sense of the term. She's a scientist. She's a researcher. And she's using uh, a bioreactor to engage in uh, 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 biotechnology experimentation in 1995 on the space shuttle. Uh, the EVA experience, sometimes, by the way, I put up here, hi, mom because uh, that seems to be what he's kind of doing. Uh, but we have learned remarkably how to engage in spacewalks. We did them during Apollo. We did them during Gemini. Yes, all that's true. But the number of hours and the range of activities that have been engaged in in the space shuttle program is just unbelievable, including the building of this un uh, unfathomable, uh, really s stupendous, technological feat of the space station in Earth orbit, done by the crews of multiple space shuttle flights. 
And then, of course, the landing back uh, uh, on the runway down at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, landing like an airplane. You don't have to be rescued at sea. By the way, this looks almost like a piece of art, doesn't it? It's not. It's a nighttime landing at the Cape uh, with a very inventive uh, photographer who took this particular picture. Uh, I, I, love, I love political cartoons. And some of you probably like them as well. Um, in 1993, this was one of the cartoons in the Washington Post. Uh, and here you can see Endeavour, the orbiter, uh, the astronauts, and the Hubble Space Telescope. And you'll recall that the Hubble had blurred vision when it was first launched. And so they, they had to fit it with glasses, corrective lenses. And, uh, and that's literally what happened. I mean, not quite like that, but nonetheless, uh, it tells the story very nicely. Uh, and we've done this five times with the Hubble so far, most recently in 2009. Uh, and we now have a Hubble Space Telescope that's going to be good to go for another six, seven years probably uh, before its service life will be over and we'll be able to launch the next generation space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, to carry on where Hubble's left off. Uh, this is the John Glenn flight I mentioned to you. Uh, the cartoon reads, NASA tests the effects of aging in space. And here's John Glenn, and he's saying, in my day, we had to walk 15 miles to the launch pad, and it was uphill both ways in the snow. Um, they made us drink Tang three times a day, and we liked it. Anybody know what Tang is? OK. Anybody been forced to drink it? OK. Um, slow down, you're driving like a bat out of hell. And a mission control says, discovery, your turn signal is on. We also did a, sh a docking program with, this, with the Russian Mir space station in the 1990s. A pretty remarkable experience in and of itself. And here you can see uh, the shuttle docked to the Mir space station. This is a Russian space station. It's actually a pretty big vehicle in comparison to how small that Mir was. And, um, and it worked pretty well. And here you can see as the, as the shuttle's coming into dock, here's the Russian cosmonaut looking out the window at him. We had two tragedies, and you know those stories. 1986, when we lost the crew of uh, Challenger, and 2003, when we lost the crew of, of, of Columbia. Those were stunningly uh, uh, sad and, and amazing events, and uh, we hope to never see those sorts of things repeated again. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that this happened and, and, and pay our respects to that. I also like this political cartoon in that context where you see the astronaut on the moon, the flag at half mast as he's bowed in prayer associated with the Columbia accident. Uh, be that as it may, the American public has always said the shuttle was a good investment. If you at, so in, in answer to the question, is the space shuttle a good investment, the blue is yes. Overwhelmingly, we love this program. It's an amazing thing, and it, and it doesn't matter what's taking place in the world. This starts in 1981. It runs through May of 2004, so both of the accidents are reflected in this as well. We love it. That does not translate into people wanting to fly on it. Uh, if you ask the question, are you willing to travel into space, how many of you are willing to go into space? I would expect everybody here to raise their hand for this one. I'll go in a heartbeat. Uh, if anybody would let me. Uh, but, we, but the general public as a whole is not in that category. The yes answer is blue, the no answer is red, and generally speaking, actually all the time, more people say, no, nah, I don't really think so. Uh, but we do like the shuttle, and I think that that's an important story to be told. We built the space station with it. Uh, obviously, here you can see some activities associated with building. Here's the ISS in orbit. And you may have seen this picture, but I find it stunning. You look at, here's the sun. Uh, it's properly filtered. You see that little speck there? Watch this. Isn't that great? That's the ISS and the shuttle docked to it uh, against the sun in the background. And here it is looking at you. And, and, and now we're going to tell the story of the legacy of this 30-year experience with the space shuttle. We're doing this in part out at the udvar Hazi Center right out here. This is Enterprise, which was a test vehicle. We're going to swap uh, Enterprise for Discovery, hopefully in the next year or so. And, uh, and Enterprise will go elsewhere, and we'll have Discovery, a flown orbiter, uh, in the udvar Hazi Center. This is this room, as you know. 
And, uh, and we've got this orbiter back in the background, and we're going to tell the story of shuttle station and beyond uh, in this particular exhibition space. And then finally, let me close by simply saying, I, we're, we're, it's kind of bittersweet that, we're, that the shuttle is being retired, but it deserves an honorable retirement. It served venerably for 30 years, and we've done remarkable things with it. It's time to trade it in on a newer model. It's like when you go get a new car. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, with spaceflight in the United States. For a few years, we're going to fly astronauts on the Soyuz capsules. Those work pretty well. The Russians are happy to sell us rides. Uh, and then we're going to follow that with, uh, with other vehicles that will enable us to go to and from the space station. Those vehicles are going to be built and owned by private sector firms. That's kind of a change. Uh, and that will then free NASA to focus on deep space activities. How do you get out of low Earth orbit? Which is what we ultimately want to do. So NASA's next task is to build the big spacecraft and the big launchers that's going to take us to asteroids, to the moon, to Mars, to other places. That's where we are. Thank you very much. We're going to be moving outward as you saw the Earth recede into the background. We're going to literally be doing that in the future. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for a few quick questions, if sure. anybody wants to ask? If you have a, cu a couple of quick questions, please come to the microphone. Okay, so you said that Dinosaur was almost ready to fly. Did they actually build one? They built, yes. They built, Where they bent it? metal on that, and they had airframes manufactured. Where, where are they? Uh, they were destroyed. Oh, because that was always the It's a shame. It's thing. a tragedy. But it's a little bit like that flying wing that D D Douglas Company built in the 1940s, and every one of them was torn apart. Uh, you can't find them anywhere. It, it, that sometimes happens. Yes? Um, I'm sorry if this is not something that you're um, very familiar with, but um, we actually ran into a woman on the plane who worked for NASA. It wasn't coming to this conference, but was coming to another meeting here at the same time. And she was mentioning along, along the same with you is that you know, the future of NASA is to explore deep space and especially in particular dark matter. It might be interesting if you can speak to it at all for the kids to kind of understand how much energy, the capabilities of the what is yet unexplored in the dark matter and dark space? Oh, yeah. Uh, apparently, something in the neighborhood of 96% of the matter that exists in the cosmos is what we call this dark matter or dark energy. 96%. We only have this very poor understanding of what is out there. We can't even characterize what this stuff is, really. Uh, but we're trying to understand it and, and explore it. But we can calculate that there is all of this stuff out there that we know literally nothing about. And so there's a lot of effort associated with dark matter, dark energy research that's underway. Uh, and if you go into the Explore the Universe gallery, which is directly across from here, uh, and swing to the left as you go in, you will walk into a section that, that talks about Margaret Geller and her research on dark energy. Uh, it talks about Chandra, uh, the spacecraft that was engaged in, the, in activities associated with this, and uh, you can learn a lot more about that. But it, it, is, it, is a, it is a puzzle to which we have only a few of the pieces. Yes? What do you mean by dark energy and dark matter? Well, we call it that. We call it dark energy and we call it dark matter uh, simply because we don't know what else to call it. We can't characterize it. We, mathematically, we know that something is there, but we don't know what that something is. And, uh, and scientists are working very hard to try to understand that more effectively, but it, it, it's, it's a mystery. It's a total mystery at this point. In your opinion, what are some of the most important lessons that can go from the shuttle program and be applied to future deep space exploration? Sure, OK. Um, so in terms of lessons from the shuttle program, I, I think you know, there's one that we learned that uh, is kind of a negative lesson. It's harder to do than we ever thought it was going to be. Uh, when NASA came out of the Apollo program, I mean, it was literally sitting on top of the world because it had accomplished this amazing feat, and it believed it could do anything. Uh, and so building an Earth orbital vehicle that uh, is reusable, they thought would be no problem at all. It's harder than we thought. It's, and it's harder to fly in space than we thought it was going to be. It's certainly not impossible. We can certainly do it safely. We can do it routinely. 
Uh, there is some risk involved, but we can reduce that risk significantly, but it's very difficult, and it's going to require uh, a, a concerted effort on a, on a broad front to try to make it uh, more normal than it has become with the shuttle program. That's, that's the first lesson I would, would suggest to you. Uh, the, the second one I, would, I, I think is remarkable, and, and it's not just the shuttle that demonstrated this, but the International Space Station as well. The, the fact that we can do this on an international basis in a peaceful way. You know, the, uh, the shuttle started this process. The ISS has kind of made it the norm. Uh, but think about it for a moment. We have countries all around the world engaged in this activity. They have astronauts that are flying on shuttles, uh, flying to the International Space Station. They are building pieces of ISS, building experiment packages, building all kinds of other things. Uh, with it, by, by engineers with different languages, different cultures, different systems of measurement. Uh, and they bring all of this together peacefully and they put it up into space and it works. It, when we look back on this era in space flight 100 years from now, I think the, 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 the first thing that people will point to, the first success we will point to, is that this is the largest, most comprehensive, most sophisticated, peaceful effort ever engaged in by multiple nations in the world. And it's a model for possibilities for the future. Sir, how does NASA plan on keeping the public engaged during this period of time when there's going to be a, a need to build up for the next step? Well, there's a whole variety of things underway in terms of, of, of public engagement. And, and it, I, I hasten to add that while the human program is going to be transitioning to new vehicles and are going to be flying on Soyuz capsules for a while, it, they are not, that program is not ending by any means. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think that interest associated with that is going to continue. Uh, and the other parts of the NASA program, the space science piece, the earth sciences, the aeronautics, uh, all of that is continuing literally unchanged. Uh, so those kinds of efforts will continue to engage the public in the ways they have previously. But I do think NASA has a challenge before it. In fact, all of us who are interested in space flight have a challenge, whether it be Americans or other people around the world, uh, to, uh, uh, to explore how we might effectively communicate to those who don't understand why we're doing this. I was on a radio talk show this morning, and the first question they asked me was, why do we care about this stuff? What's important about flying astronauts into space? Well, everyone should have an answer to that question. And, and my answer is because ultimately we have to get off of this planet. And we have to become a multi-planetary species. That's going to take centuries. But if we don't get started, it's never going to happen. And, uh, and if we don't, we will surely become extinct on this planet. It's just a question of when. Um, and, and, and the problem with that is that you know, the best case scenario is several billion years in the future, the sun will become a red giant, it will engulf the Earth, and everybody here will be dead. True enough. We have to be planet hopping other places before that happens. Um, but it's impossible to get a member of Congress excited about something that's a threat several billion years in the future. Uh, so that's not going to generate a lot of support. But I do believe that, that that's the fundamental goal of human spaceflight. And if that's not it, then what is it? Um, and we need, to, we need to be about that. So that, that's the argument. But everybody needs to have their own answer uh, for that particular question. I think that's enough for today. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you much.